The era of the cheap mid-engine car is dead. Cars like the Pontiac Fiero and the Toyota MR2 are a thing of the past. No one, and I mean no one, is talking about making a cheap midship car anytime soon, and almost certainly never will again. Why is the most balanced and sporty setup for a car only reserved for supercars these days? Why can't a company like Honda take the Civic Type R drivetrain, drop it in the back of a Dell Soul-like body, and sell it for cheap? Why is a concept that seems so easy, so rare and expensive? Well, today on Wheelhouse, we're gonna show why mid-engine cars should be really common, and why they're not. A big thanks to Helix for sponsoring today's video. By now, you all know my motto about sleep, so say it with me. Sleep is the most important meal of the day. And finding the right matchers for me has always been a challenge. That's why I ordered a Helix, because in just a few clicks, I'm paired with the best mattress for me. Helix understands that everyone is different and even developed a sleep quiz that matches your body type and sleep preferences to the perfect mattress for you. I personally like a medium feel and often sleep on my tum tum. So Helix paired me with the Helix Dust Lux. And to prove how comfortable it is, I decided to make my animated self jump out of a plane and land on it for a comfortable, dramatic effect. Ooh, that's comfy. But you know what's better than finding the perfect mattress? How about Helix delivering it right to your front door? It even comes with a 100 night sleep trial so you can be sure it's the perfect match or they'll come pick it up themselves and give you a full refund. So say goodbye to uncomfortable mattresses and head on over to helixsleep.com slash donutmedia or click the link in the description to receive up to $200 off your mattress plus two free pillows. Um, animator, two pillows please? Huh, <laughs> that's more like it. If you're not sure why I'm making such a big deal about mid-engine cars, let me explain. There's a reason that every supercar from Lamborghini, McLaren, Bugatti, Pagani, and most Ferraris are all mid-engined. For a sports car, you want rear-wheel drive. As the car accelerates, the weight of the car shifts backward, making the front wheels go light and the rear wheels push into the asphalt, gaining traction. But beyond that, mid-engine cars have another advantage, and that has to do with the polar moment of, you know what? This is getting a little too physics-y for me. I'll let my fellow donut host, Jeremiah, explain. Thank you, Nolan. Now, the polar moment of inertia concept is an extension of Isaac Newton's first law of motion. An object in motion stays in motion, and an object at rest stays at rest. It's resistant to change, just like rumors, and this is called inertia. A polar moment of inertia refers to an object's resistance to rotating around an axis. The axis pole in this case is the drive wheels. As the engine turns, one of two things is gonna happen. Either the wheels are gonna rotate, or if the wheels were fixed in space, the car would rotate around those wheels. Now the amount of force it would take to rotate the car once is measured in distance over time. If all the weight of the car was at the furthest point from our axis, it would have to travel a further distance in the same amount of time therefore requiring more work. But if all the weight were nearer to the axis, it would require less work because it would travel less distance. And it means a mid-engine car would be able to put more power to the ground for the same amount of work as a front-engined rear-wheel drive car. I hope that helps. Now, before we get too deep into this, let's look at the cheapest mid-engine cars on sale today. There's a $60,000 C8 Corvette, retail, the $60,000 Porsche Cayman, retail, and the recently discontinued Alfa Romeo 4C for $67,000. Not exactly economy cars. For comparison, the 1984 Pontiac Fiero started at $8,000. Even if you adjusted for inflation, you could still buy two of those for the price of a current mid-engine car. Even a fully specced out SW20 MR2 Turbo from 1989 would have only been about $40,000 in today's money. And that was the most expensive version. So what gives? Why are all these new mid-engine cars so much more expensive? Well, it all starts with engines. In the Corvette, the Cayman, and the 4C, those engines are designed for their respective chassis. For comparison, in the Fiero, the MR2, and even the Lotus Elise, that wasn't the case. They all used transversely mounted engines from existing front wheel drive cars. The Fiero used the same four cylinder Iron Duke from the legendary Pontiac 6000 LE, and the last MR2 that Toyota made was using the same 1ZZ engine from the Celica GT. One of my best friends in college pronounced Celica Celicia. 
And I thought that was very funny. See, when you have a front wheel drive car, the power has to make it to the wheels that are next to the engine. It goes down an axle or half shaft coming out of each side of the transmission. If that car was front engined and rear wheel drive, the power would have to go out the back of the transmission down the drive shaft to get to the rear differential and the rear wheels. And since nearly 90% of cars in the US drive the front wheels in some way, most engines these days are transversely mounted. So to make a front engined rear wheel drive car, you have to design an entire entirely new drivetrain, which is expensive. But wait, what if you could just take that front engine, front wheel drivetrain and drop it in the middle of a sporty coupe? You'd save money and you have a sporty car that enthusiasts would love. Seems like a no brainer, right? So why is no one doing it now? Why can't VW stick their GTI engine in the back of a Jetta? Or maybe Fiat put their Barth engine in the back of a 500 where it was in the 50s? Well, it's not that simple. First is the most obvious problem, the market. The sports car market is already small with most enthusiast cars being hot versions of an existing platform. You got your Golf GTIs, Veloster Ns, and Civic Type Rs. They're all based on platforms of cheaper economy cars. Cars that are already designed for an engine up front. Not only is there no space in the back, but you'd have to completely redesign the chassis and the weight distribution of all the other heavy components like the fuel tank. And it means that you might as well be designing a dedicated platform. Cheap sports cars with dedicated platforms like the Toyota 86 are getting more and more uncommon as new buyers don't seem to be looking for dedicated sports car unless they're in the next tier up price-wise. Toyota and Subaru had to share development on the 86 and BRZ just so they could afford the R&D. The only other cheap sports cars that are really making any kind of money are legacy cars. Cars like the Mustang, Miata, and Camaro. These cars are very capable, but part of what makes them affordable to build is the built-in market that comes with the name. And a big part of that is the fact that these cars haven't really changed their formula since day one. Remember how up in arms people got when Ford first announced a turbocharged four-cylinder Mustang? Imagine if they announced that they'd be changing the whole look, chassis, and drivetrain configuration. It'd be the Mach-E all over again. Not that Mach-E is a bad car. They're cool, but you know, it's an SUV. And I know you're gonna say that the Corvette did it with the C8 and everyone loves it, but the C8 Corvette is a bit of an anomaly. It's the only recognized nameplate that has changed from front engine to mid engine in years. And let's not forget that the Corvette took decades to go mid engine. Zora Arcus Duntov, the Belgian engineer known as the father of the Corvette was pushing for mid engine as early as 1966. And on top of all that, GM ate the real cost of the C8 because at launch they were losing 20 grand per car. <laughs> it's a pretty big gamble. And while it seems to have paid off, I doubt we'll see any manufacturer do the same. If you want to know more about Zora Arcus Duntov and the story of the Corvette, check out our podcast on the subject, Past Gas. I think by now that episode has come out. So if an established name can't change to mid-engine, it's gonna be a brand new car, which means the marketing team is gonna step in and say that they can't sell a car that no one knows about. The only way any manufacturer could viably make a mid-engine car today is by reviving an old name that was already mid-engined. But hold your horses because I don't see a 2022 Fiero on the horizon anytime soon. But none of this means that a manufacturer couldn't kick the accountants out an open window and just make one anyway. Maybe a manufacturer like Hyundai? In 2019, Hyundai showed off a mid-engine track concept called the RM19. This thing has a six-speed sequential gearbox, a near 50-50 weight distribution, and about 400 horsepower. The RM19 placed their TCR race car engine where the groceries should be in a Veloster chassis, and then they stiffened up the floor and gave it rear axles to be a racing midship RM19. 19, you get it? But sadly, that project is a one-off that won't ever see the streets, and even if it wasn't, I don't think it would have landed in the cheap category. The RM19 wasn't built to be a road car, and there would have been a lot of work to make it more practical. And there's another development that is the final nail in the coffin for the cheap mid-engine car, and that is electrification. Many manufacturers are showing off their dedication to EVs by announcing their plans to eliminate internal combustion engines from their fleet. Mini, Audi, Jaguar, and even the legendary mid-engine car makers at Lotus have committed to an all EV lineup before 2030. And the thing is, when it comes to EVs, mid-engine doesn't really matter as much. The motor placement and distribution of weight in EVs is totally different right now because it's no longer the motor that holds the most weight. Now, it's the batteries themselves. In cars like the Tesla Model S, 
where the motor is in relation to the axle doesn't mean anything because the motor is the axle, essentially. And yes, we are gonna see some great gas-powered cars in the next few years, and I'm personally betting Dodge wants to make a 1,000 horsepower road car before the end of the ICE era, but the development time on a midship platform would take years. The first mule car for the C8 Corvette was hand-built in 2014 as a proof of concept. So if someone wanted to sell a cheap, dedicated midship platform as the last hurrah of the internal combustion engine with enough of a sales window to make it worth it, they'd have to announce it now. So it's looking like the mid-engine car has had its day and now it's time to move on to something else. But you know, maybe I'm wrong. After all, Tesla's first car, the Tesla Roadster, was built on the mid-engine chassis of a Lotus Elise. And maybe someone will give their internal combustion engines a last hurrah in a midship coupe. Maybe Hyundai, who knows? Maybe Dodge builds a, now they, they wouldn't do that. <laughs> maybe we just keep them alive ourselves by working on old ones. Thank you very much for watching Wheelhouse this week. It's always an immense pleasure to make these videos for you. Follow Donut on all social media, at Donut Media. And if you're a Donut super freak, consider checking out the Donut Underground by clicking that join button below. You get access to a Discord server, special behind the scenes videos, early access to exclusive merch, and you even get a sticker. How cool is that? Follow me on all social media as well, at Nolan J Sykes, Instagram, TikTok, Twitter. I'm there, wasting my time. No. <laughs> Be kind, I'll see you next week.